We're good. Okay. All right, everyone. Welcome to uh, Hebrew Institute Live. Where is your mouth? Let me get okay. Let me do this. Got it. There we go. Look at all these beautiful people online. All right. <laughs> good to see all of you. All right, do we have Marcia? Yes, we do have Marcia Austin. Hey, Katrina. Hello, everyone. Uh, Boise and Renee, you two are in two different spots. Uh, unmute yourselves. Uh-uh, I don't hear you. Boise, unmute yourself. Okay, Renee? Brad, unmute yourself. Let me make sure. It's not oh, okay. Can you can you hear okay, me now? Yeah, yeah, I can hear you. Yeah. Okay. What it is? I think something is wrong with the computer audio. We were trying to check to see which one. So we're going to get off of the um, computer and get on the phone until we can figure out what's going on. Okay. Well, we hear you. Yeah. Yeah. You can't because it's my phone is unmuted, but the computer is ah. unmuted. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Something's going on with the computer link. Okay. Okay. All right then. All right. Well, it seems like everybody's here, and uh, um, all our readers are here, and you have a, a schedule. I need to uh, look and see if we have a schedule. Uh, schedule all the readings and everything. All right, all right. Good to see you here at Hebrew Institute Live. Please be patient with us. We were having a few technical difficulties here. I'm here at a wonderful Lena and Rich's house today. We're just coming back from the youth facility and everything. Let's open up with uh, a, a power prayer from Marcia. And then uh, there are those who were at the youth facility. I want you to give a testimony. It's testimony service. Come on. Uh, Connie, you know all about testimony service now. Okay. You know about a testimony service. Okay. Marcia, go ahead and give us a power prayer. Good to see you. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yeah, it's the Shabbat. Praise God. Thank you, Father. Glory to God. Father, we thank you. Once again, bringing us together, oh God, Father God, we are so thankful, Father, for being in your midst, Father, that you dwell with your people, Daddy God. Father, thank you for taking care of us and for your guidance, for your love and for your protection, Father. Father, we are just wanting to praise your name and lift you up on high, for you are deserving, so deserving of all the adoration, Father God. Blessed is your holy name forever and ever. We magnify your name. We lift you up on high, Father God. Wonderful Savior, our mighty God, King of kings and Lord of lords, you are Adonai, our everything, Father. Father, we thank you for the service. We thank you, Father God, for your word that you're bringing to us today, Father God. Thank you, Father God, for bringing us into another season of Passover, Father God, where you bring us out, Father God, and kept us, Lord God. Lord, we are asking you, God, Lord, for, to touch each and every one, Father God, at whom may need a touch from you, Father God, whether it be healing, whatever it may be, Father God. For we know, Daddy God, that you care for us and you will take care of us and every need that we have, we lay it at your feet, Father God. Thank you, Father God, for taking care of our sister, Father God, Miriam, oh God, that you brought her back home safe, Father God, and that she is in your loving arms, Father God, resting and secure, knowing, Daddy God, that you love her, Father God, and that you will take care of her. Father, thank you for our pastor Israel, oh God, as she brings your word to us this day, Father God. Thank you for lifting her up and for giving her, Father God, the strength that she needs, Father God. And thank you for all that, God, that you're doing in her life, Father God, for her ministry, the ministry for us, Father God. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you, Lord God, for loving us. We pray for Israel, Father God. We pray for your shalom, Father God. We pray, Daddy God, that you would bring peace to that land, O oh God. Lord, we know there is no true peace until you come, Father God. But, Daddy God, we know we are trusting on you to help, Father God, where there is a need, where there is where struggles and troubles, Father God, that you are in the midst and you are working it out the way you see fit, Father God. Thank you for us in this land, Father God, of America, the places that we dwell in respectively, Father God, that Daddy God, Lord God, that you will give us prosperity, that we will prosper in the place that you have us, Father God, that we will be a light, Father God, and show forth your goodness and your mercy with all that we have, with all that we are, Daddy God. We give you glory. We give you, shall, we give you Father God, praise and honor, Father God. Thank you for your shalom in our lives, Father God. Thank you for keeping us, Father God. Thank you for the word which directs us and leads us and guides us, Father God, which lifts us up, Father God. Father, thank you for your goodness. And it's in the mighty name of Yeshua we pray. Amen. 
Amen and amen. All right, uh, Connie and Ed, uh, let's see, you were at, uh, let's let's say a prayer to keep uh, Jenny's sister, okay, in, um, okay, in prayer. I'll tell you what, is that my phone? Yeah. Let's put it right here. Okay. All right, keep her uh, sister in prayer. Brad, I didn't get a chance to look at the, uh, at, at the text. Okay, but just keep her sister in prayer. Okay, please. She's at the uh, urgent care center now. Yeah. All right. Well, we are uh, sending the uh, hand of God over there to touch whatever is is wrong with her right now. Oh, yeah. Father, in the mighty name of Yeshua Hamashiach, we ask you to stretch forth your hands of healing to Jenny's sister, O oh, Heavenly Father. And let her, O oh, Heavenly Father, know that you are with her, O oh, Heavenly Father. Lord, you lead and guide each and every health professional that she is going to come in contact with. But even better yet, Lord, you be the chief physician in charge, okay, of her care. And Father, we're asking you to stretch forth your hand and heal. Touch her from the crown of the head to the soles of her feet, O oh, Heavenly Father, and heal. And we thank you for what you're about to do in the mighty name of Yeshua HaMashiach. Amen and amen. Hallelujah, God. You said you sent your word and you healed them of all their, their ailments. So, Father, we send this word now, O Heavenly Father, to wherever she is, that she be healed, that she raise up and be healed in Yeshua's name. Amen and amen. Let me say something. Never negate the power of prayer. I was telling some on Thursday. Um, we got one of our members, uh, Doug, Hollander, who, uh, and keep him in prayer, uh, elderly gentleman, he was once president of the club as well as uh, a district general, uh, governor rather, okay, of the club and everything. And he recently lost his wife a few months ago. I think we had him in prayer about losing his wife. Well, you know, when you've been married for decades and decades and decades, to lose a spouse, especially when you're, you know, in your 80s or so, is very devastating, can be de devastating. You know, and so anyway, his health, you know, uh, um, has been going uh, down. And they called me to tell me that he was uh, in the hospital on a ventilator. Okay. And if we could pray. And so the next day we went in. Now, Doug, I think I talked to you a couple of years ago. He's the one that whose plant, plane decided to hit the side of a mountain. Okay. And he wound up surviving okay his plane hitting the side of a mountain and i'll never forget never forget okay we were at a rotary meeting then when someone got a phone call to say that that happened and immediately we went into prayer we went into prayer right there at the meeting for that and next thing we know you know uh he was in the uh he was in the hospital okay uh um, his injuries okay were severe at the time but after that prayer he healed so quickly it was amazing how fast he healed and was able to get back home this was in i think he was in nevada he was in some crazy place okay when the uh i don't know maybe the mountain just decided to get up and the plane was in the way <laughs> i don't know what happened but all i know is that his plane hit a mountain he was in the plane when it hit the mountain Okay, you know, but uh, he survived that. So I always call him our miracle man. All right, our miracle man. So when we began to pray, we prayed, we reminded God of the miracles that were in his body. Okay, and it's like Doug still, Doug is going to be, I asked him to be a member of my board. Okay, when I take over as president of that club. And it's like, God, you know, I need Doug. Oh, okay, I need Doug. Raise him up, God. Raise him up off of that ventilator. And so anyway, uh, we went on with the meeting and everything. And then uh, a couple of hours later, I got a text to say that Doug is off the ventilator. He's okay, breathing on his own and everything. And never negate the power of our prayer, guys, when we get together. Like we say, teamwork makes the dream work. But wherever two or more gather together in my name, there I am in the midst of them. So when we get together and pray, when we get together and pray, it moves the hand of God. Okay, it moves the hand of God. So, you know, uh, um, I pray for, you know, uh, him being raised up, you know, pray, continued prayers 
you know, for uh, Miriam and everything, because it's a devastating thing. Even her mean knows the devastating thing about losing a child. I'm, we're still, you know, that's not a club you really want to be in. Okay, it's not a club you want to be in, but there's something, you know, our arms go out to both Hermine and, and uh, Miriam because, uh, you know, I'm there, okay, uh, uh, I'm there with you. So keep them in prayer. Uh, keep this country in prayer, okay, please. We are going through a difficult time. Uh, keep Is Isatu, okay, Isatu, one of our, our children, okay, in prayer. You remember I talked to you about her. She was the one who... We were at service, okay, over at the yeshiva when the pastor called, I think. And uh, he was at the police station with the children. The person came in and uh, said that their mother had passed away and everything and dropped the kids off at the police station. And Pastor Abdul, you know, said, call, call me right up. What should I do? And it's like, what do you mean what should you do? Take the kids to the center, okay? And we bought the beds. You remember, we bought all those beds for the kids and everything, sent the pictures on all of that. Well, when I got over to Sierra Leone, I found out that everything was not the way it said. Isatu gave her testimony, and her testimony was that that woman was her stepmother. And as the stepmother, she did not like those kids. She would send those kids out every day to go in the streets to get money for her. Now, just put your imagination to work, okay, with that sending out young girls in the street to get money for you. Okay, and so uh, uh, finally she convinced the stepfather to allow her to take the kids to abandon them at the, okay, police station. Not the stepfather, the stepmother convinced their real father. And the father would not listen to the kids, he listened to his new wife, okay, and allowed her to take his children and abandon them, okay, at the police station. All right. Well, Issa too has sickle cell. All right. And right now she's in the hospital and I praise God. Let me tell you, I cannot praise God for all of you enough. I cannot because we have the finances to, to help her go to the hospital. Okay. Uh, there and get, uh, get aid and everything. So I'm contracting with Dr. Tucker to be able to have sort of like an insurance, you know, insurance policy. We put some money on the books. So that whenever the kids need something, Pastor Abdul doesn't have to, you know, have to worry about taking them, okay, to the hospital. You know, he'll just be able to take them to the hospital. They'll be able to get the care that they need, even if they have to have an ambulance. We have the kind of care that if they have to be have an ambulance, we will be able to get those children, okay, the care that they finally need. Because some of them have some uh, serious health you know, health challenges. So, you know, I thank God for all of you, okay, and your willingness, okay, uh, to give and your willingness to feel compassion for orphan, you know, for orphan children. Some of the stories that they had would make your hair stand on end. It just makes you want to weep and cry to think that these children are so young and have gone through some of the things that they have gone through. But, you know, God it will truly, truly bless you for what, you know, you are doing. As I said, we also sent over uh, finances uh, towards their rent for the year. Okay, we're almost uh, finished paying that off. We have one more payment of that, the rent for the year. Uh, okay, with that. We also paid for some of them need tutoring, okay, in English, okay, because they're not doing as well as they can because they need a little tutoring in English. So we paid for it's only... I think $50 for the entire month for a tutor. Hello, $50 for the month. You know, I could eat that in a week. Okay, <laughs> that is two meals. Okay. So we sent that, you know, sent that over to make sure the children uh, have a chance to succeed. They got some good grades, but they could get better grades if they had a little more tutoring. Okay, with that. So uh, we are doing that for you know, doing that for them. We also uh, sent finances so that they will all be able to go to Passover in uh, Freetown. I think next weekend they may be having their Seder either next weekend. I'm not sure if they're having it on Wednesday or not, but they will uh, also be able to do that, okay, and celebrate uh, Passover. And I think this is about the third Passover that they will be at. They've been celebrating all of the Feast of the Lord which is great. They have their, as a matter of fact, they have their uh, Sabbath services 
you know, every single Sabbath, a lot of times they'll call, call me so that I can talk to them, you know, uh, on the phone and everything. And they call during evening prayer, Friday's evening prayer or Saturday evening prayer. They call and they pray for all of you guys. Okay. They pray for all of you guys too. So no, you made such of a big, big impact on these children, just on these children. And I want to thank you all you know, for what it is that you're doing and your labor of love in taking care of these orphans, okay, these orphans. So anyway, don't think, Tani, you're getting out of them giving a testimony. <laughs> okay, that's <laughs> it. All right, so Connie and Ed give a test uh, testimonial, okay. Uh, I think you two were the only ones beside me that were in there. You didn't go in, yeah. Okay, give a testimonial about um, the children today. <laughs> Well, wait, let me see. That's how cold you started. Huh? First of all, I want to give thank God, <laughs> <laughs> Pastor Saints and friends. But no. <laughs> um, wonderful. I, I'm so glad to be a part of this ministry, uh, that youth, youth facility. Uh, the great people that's there, it's loving and caring. Um, today uh, was an early birthday present being that my birthday is tomorrow. Today was an early birthday present for me. The love that was shown to me from these three young men that just came to me, one of them I had been thinking about all the time since the first time I saw him. And he, he's working on anger issues and, and I could relate to a lot of things that he was going through. And the minute the young man that spoke today was off the chain. I mean, he was fired up for God, honey. No matter what he went through, he told us his story. And I'm telling you, it is a story. It is a story to hear. And God changed his life around and he captured the attention. That's what was so much, so very important. He captured the attention of the young men trying to persuade them not to have to let this be your last stop, you know, uh, going through this, uh, being incarcerated, you know. And uh, they were listening and it had an impact on them. So that part uh, was very good, very, very good. And then I started listening to Pastor. Pastor was talking to some things she was talking about. Uh, uh, I too am in that club of losing a child. I had brought up more things about it, you know. And, and when she was saying things, my heart just dropped, you know what I'm saying? We wonder why, but everything has a reason and a purpose for everything in our lives. So today was just an awesome day all the way around. And I enjoyed it 100%. Waiting for next month. <laughs> amen, amen. All right, Ed. Or, uh, uh, do we refer to you as Ed or Mr. Connie? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, it's a challenge getting up on Saturday morning to go there. But uh, never, ever disappointed. And today was just, it was a blessing to us. Uh, the kids are getting younger, which is kind of alarming. They seem like they're 12 and 13 years old. But anyway, the testimony of Mr. Marcus Carter, I believe C-A-R-D-R. -E Marcus Carter is the gentleman's name. He has a book called Red Lion. His testimony was off the chart. I mean, it was just, it was uplifting to everyone, the staff, us, the children, everyone. And it is a remarkable story. If you could find his book or testimony, uh, look it up. I'm sure he has some online websites online, but uh, it was awesome. We were we were ministered to today, mm -hmm. so it was just a blessing. I can't explain how much it was a blessing. Only thing as much significant as that was the DJ when the DJ comes, uh, DJ win. But this young man, he just his testimony was amazing. Mm -hmm. Can't even go into details, but <laughs> a blessed day, very blessed day. Glad I made it. Thank yes. God. Yeah. Yes, I, as a matter of fact, I think I'm going to have him. Uh, I'll do a Zoom with us on uh, be, on a Sabbath. I think I'll have that would be great with right? us that on a be Sabbath great. because yes. the what uh, God had given me last night just kind of flowed right into His testimony. I didn't know He was going to be there. Did not know that uh, He was going to be there today, and it just flowed right into His what it was uh, He was talking about. So I think uh, uh, we'll have Him okay give His testimonial on on uh, line. Okay, mm -hmm. online here. I'll invite him. Okay, for this and everything. Okay, well, uh, um, let us go ahead and um, uh, let's see. We won't have the prayers from Jenny today, but who do we have uh, first? I don't have the <laughs> me. 
Glory to me, and I'm not ready for me. It's me. Okay. Okay. This is Connie from Tampa. I'll be reading from the Blue Letter Bible, Mark 12, 28 through 34. And one of the scribes came and having heard them reasoning together and perceiving that he had answered them well, asked him, which is the first commandment of all? And Yeshua answered him, the first of all the commandments is, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Thou shalt not thou, and thou shalt love Yahweh thy Elohim with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. And the second is like, namely this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There is none other commandment greater than these. And the scribe said unto him, Well, master, thou, thou hast said the truth. For there is one Elohim, and there is none other but he. And to love him with all the heart and with all the understanding, and with all the soul and with all the strength, and to love his neighbor as himself is more than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. And when Yeshua saw that he answered discreetly, he said unto him, Thou art not from the kingdom of Elohim. And no man after the dirt asked him any question. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat Great. Shalom. I'm Katrina. <laughs> this is Katrina from um, North Carolina. I'll be reading Romans. <laughs> My apologies. Romans 12, 1. One and two. Beseech, beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercy of Elohim and ye presence of our bodies, a living sacrifice, holy, a holy, acceptable unto Elohim, which is your reasonable service, and be not conformed to this world, but ye be transformed by the renewing of your mind that ye may prove that what is good and acceptable and perfect will Elohim. Shabbat Shalom, Grace. Shabbat Shalom. I'll be reading 1 Corinthians 10, 14 through 23. Wherefore, my dearly beloved, flee from idolatry. I speak as to wise men, judge ye what I say. The cup of blessing which bless, is it not communion of the blood of Messiah? The bread which we break, is it not communion of the body of Messiah? For we being many are one bread and one body, for we are all partakers of that one bread. Behold Israel after the flesh, are not they which eat of the sacrifices partakers of the altar? What say I then, that the idol is anything or that which is offered in sacrifice to idols is anything? But I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils and not to Elohim. And I would not that ye should have fellowship with devils. Ye cannot drink the cup of, the, of Yahweh and the cup of the devils. Ye cannot be partakers of Yahweh's table and of the table of devils. Do we provoke Yahweh to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? All things are lawful for me but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but all things edify not. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat. This is Renee from North Carolina. And we'll be coming from Jeremiah, the seventh chapter, verses 21, and then up to uh, chapter eight, verse three. And then we're gonna jump to Chapter 9, verses 22 through 23. Thus saith Yahweh, Sabaoth, 
the Elohim of Israel. Add your burnt offerings to your other sacrifices and eat the meat. For when I freed your fathers from the land of Egypt, I did not speak with them or command them concerning burnt offerings or sacrifice. But this is what I commanded them. Do my bidding that I may be your Elohim and you may be my people. Walk only in the way that I adjoin upon you that it may go well with you. Yet they did not listen or give ear. They followed their own counsels, the willfulness of their evil hearts. They have gone backward, not forward, from the day your fathers left the land of Egypt until today. And though I kept sending all my servants, the prophets, to them daily and persistently, they would not listen to me or give ear. They stiffened their necks. They acted worse than their fathers. You shall say all these things to them, but they will not listen to you. You shall call to them, but they will not respond to you. Then say to them, this is the nation that would not obey Yahweh their Elohim, that would not accept rebuke. Faithfulness has perished, vanished from their mouths. Shear your locks and cast them away. Take up a lament on the heights, for Yahweh has spurned and cast off the brood that provoked his wrath. For the people of Judah have done what displeases me, declares Yahweh. They have set up their abominations in the house which is called by my name, that they have defiled it. And they have built the shrines of Topeth in the valley of Ben-Hinnom to burn their sons and daughters in fire which I never commanded, which never came to my mind. Assuredly, a time is coming, declares Yahweh, when men shall no longer speak of Topeth or the valley of Ben-Hinnom, but of the valley of slaughter. And they shall bury in Topeth until no room is left. The carcasses of this people shall be food for the birds of the sky and the beasts of the earth with none to frighten them off and I will silence in the towns of Judah and the streets of Jerusalem, the sound of mirth and gladness, the voice of bridegroom and bride, for the whole land shall fall to ruin. At that time, declares Yahweh, the bones of the kings of Judah, of its officers, of the priests, of the prophets, and of the inhabitants of Jerusalem shall be taken out of their graves, and exposed to the sun, the moon, and all the hosts of heaven, which they loved and served and followed, to which they turned and bowed down. They shall not be to be gathered for reburial. They shall become dung upon the face of the earth, and death shall be preferable to life for all that are left of this wicked folk in all the other places to which I shall banish them, declares Yahweh Sabaoth. Thus saith Yahweh, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom. Let not the strong man glory in his strength. Let not the rich man glory in his riches, but only in this should one glory in his earnest devotion to me. For I, Yahweh, act with kindness, justice, and equity in the world. For in these I delight, declares Yahweh. Wow. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. I'm going to stand next to Pastor. Or on my knees when I where I should be at all the at all times. I'll be this is Lena. I'll be reading portion summary and this week of Bible history. Portion summary: the twenty-fifth reading from the Torah and second reading from the Book of Leviticus is called Zav, which means command. The name comes from the first word of Leviticus, Leviticus chapter six, verse nine where the Lord says to Moses, command Aaron and his sons, 
Zav reiterates the five types of sacrifices introduced in the previous portion, but this time discusses the priestly regulations pertaining to them. The last chapter of the reading describes the seven-day ordination of Aaron and his sons as they prepare to enter the holy priesthood. This week in Bible history, the mouth is dry. Um, Spies to Jericho, Nisan of V5, 1273 BCE. Two days before the conclusion of the 30, 30 day mourning period, following the passing of Moses on Adar 7, see Jewish history for the 7th of Nisan. Joshua dispatched two scouts, Caleb and Pincus, across the Jordan River to across the Jordan River to Jericho to gather intelligence and preparation of Israelites battle with the first city in their conquest of the Holy Land. In Jericho, they were assisted and hidden by Rahab, a woman who lived inside the city walls. Rahab later married Joshua. Jews prepared to enter Canaan. Nisan Avi 7, 1273 BCE. The Jewish nation mourned for their for 30 days following the passing of Moses. During this time, Joshua, the new leader of the Jewish nation, sent scouts to spy on the land of Canaan. See Jewish history for the 5th of Nisan. On the 7th of Nisan, the first day after the mourning period came to an end, Joshua instructed the Jews to stock up on provisions and prepare themselves to cross the Jordan River and begin the conquest of the Promised Land. This was the first time Joshua addressed the nation and they unconditionally accepted him as their new leader. The actual crossing occurred on the 10th of Nisan. Hold on, I'm going to drink some water. Oh, here you go. Mm -hmm. Oh, there's none in there. Mm -hmm. That's all I need to drop. Mm -hmm. The feast ended in Shushan, Nisan of 8, 366 BCE. The grand 180-day feast hosted by King of Akaforos came to an end of, of this day. Aka Feroz miscalculated the start date of Jeremiah's prophecy, which promised the rebuilding of the Holy Temple after 70 years of Babylonian exile. When according to, the, to his cal calculation, the 70 years had passed and the Jews were not redeemed, he orchestrated this grand party to celebrate the demise of the chosen nation. During the course of the party, he brazenly displayed many of the vessels looted from the Holy Temple by, by the Babylonian army. Seven-day feast began, Nisan of 9, 366 BCE. Following his 180-day feast for all his international subjects, which ended a day earlier, King Akbarosh began a seven-day feast for his subject living in Shushan, his capital. This feast ended with the death of his queen, of his queen Vashti, war of Egyptian firstborn. Nisan of 1313 13 BCE. On the Sabbath before the Exodus, Nisan 10 on that year, the firstborn of Egypt, he occupied the senior positions in the priesthood and government, fought a bloody battle with Pharaoh's troops. In an effort to secure the release of the Israelites and prevent the plague of the firstborn, this great miracle is commemorated each year on the Sabbath before Passover, which is therefore called Sabbath Hagadol, the Great Sabbath. This is one of the rare instances 
in which a commemorative date in the Jewish calendar is set is set by the day of the week rather than the day of the month. Miriam's passing, Nisan Aviv 10, 1274 BCE. Miriam, the sister of Moses, passed away at the age of 126 on the 10th of Nisan of the year 2487 from creation, 1274 BCE. 39 years after the Exodus and exactly one year before the children of Israel, entered the Holy Land. It is in the, the in the, the reference to her passing for the great Sabbath is commemorated on the Sabbath before Passover, rather than the calendar date of the miracle miracles occur Nisan 10. Israelites cross Jordan, Nisan V 10. 1273 BCE, three days after the two spies dispatched by Joshua scoured the city of Jericho, see entry for Nisan 7 above. The children of Israel were ready to enter the land promised by God to their ancestors as their eternal heritage. As they approached the Jordan with the holy ark carried by, by the in their land. The river parted for them as the water of the Red Sea had split when their fathers and mothers marched out of Egypt 40 years earlier. Joshua 4. Shabbat Shalom. All, all right. I, I think we tend to discount the readings for this week in Bible history. The reason I put them in there is so that you know what's going on in the Bible during that time. So if you are going through something, sometimes what you're going through is part of a cycle of what is going on at that time in the Bible. Now, uh, when it talked about the feast ending in Shushan, that is from Daniel chapter 5. Okay, Daniel chapter 5. And I'm in the uh, uh, Jewish Study Bible, JBS Jewish Study Bible, looking at the commentary, okay, on that, the commentary. All right, and uh, I'll just read that for a minute. Uh, Belshazzar was the son of Nabonidus. He was never king and only reigned as viceroy during his father's absence. And it says the great banquet. Babylonian and Persian royal feasts were notorious for their excess in cross-reference Esther chapter 1. It is the sacrilege of drinking from the temple vessels, however, especially by the concubines that is most emphasized. According to rabbinic tradition, Belteshazzar was celebrating because he thought that the prediction of the demise of the Babylonian kingdom after 70 years had been proven wrong. He had miscalculated, however, by one year. Okay, by one year. Okay, uh, uh, with that. So, you know, while the aspect of here is from um, the demise of the chosen nation, you know, the commentary says that he thought that the Bible was wrong or God was wrong in saying that Babylon would be defeated. Now, this falls in line with what we were talking about on Thursday about timelines. Remember, <laughs> you get a timeline incorrect, it can mess you up and everybody who's believing in your timeline because we eventually see what winds up happening. And uh, if you read all of Daniel chapter five, that's the mene, 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 people who barson, okay, incident that we have there. And then uh, that very night it says, Belteshazzar was killed, and next thing you know, the Medes are in power. Okay, with that. Okay, you know, I need to take some rides back and forth across the bridge because I had an awesome time, okay, talking to God as I was driving here. And I was speaking to the Lord because there are certain attitudes that I have that I never remember having when I lived in New York. 
And so I'm trying to figure certain things out. Why am I feeling this way? And he says, it's the spirit of the land. The spirit of the land. Have you ever considered where it is that you, this is one reason why it's good to study the history of where you are. The spirit of the land. So it's like, why am I having this attitude here when I never had it when I was up there? Look at where you are. Look at the spirit of the land. And there are times when we are spiritual beings that we will we will be more sensitive to certain things than others. Okay. Not only that, but if you aren't aware of that, sometimes you will take on certain attitudes that God is just trying to show you what is going on. It's not for you to be involved, okay, in it or enter into it. He's trying to show you. That's why I say we have to have the attitude of being a witness. So we know God is a judge of all the earth, right? We know that there is a heavenly court the same way there is an earthly court. Am I right? Okay, Abraham called, shall not the judge of all the earth do justice? We see that heavenly court in the book of Job. We also see it in the book of Zechariah, okay, where Joshua is brought up before the uh, heavenly court. We also see it in the book of Revelation, okay? So how many people believe Yeshua? Not just believe in Yeshua, okay? Because you can believe in Yeshua without believing Yeshua. All right? Understand. Uh, remember, even the devils believe, okay, and tremble. So if Yeshua says something, how many people really believe it? If he's teaching us a principle, how many people follow those principles? Or do we jump back into our religion, okay, once again, when certain things happen? When I was on the way over here, the Lord was really speaking to me about the Lord's Prayer, one part of the Lord's Prayer that we tend to discount, all right? Now, everybody is all excited about the judgments. We're in the end times. The judgments are upon the earth. Am I right? We've been hearing that for God knows how long. The judgments are on the earth. Well, the principle is what? Judgment begins where? In the house of God. So if the judgments are being executed on the earth, where have the judgments first been executed? In the house of God. You know, we were talking about on Thursday about the mark of God. And we went to Exodus, okay? And usually, you know, when I talk about the mark of God, I take you guys to Ezekiel chapter 8 and Ezekiel chapter 9. That talks about the a man with the ink horn that God says to go and put a mark in their foreheads and their hands on all who are sighing and crying. So in my limited, you know, mindset and everything, I'm saying, okay, this a mark of God. Remember, Satan is a great imitator. So if there is a mark of the beast who is contrary to God, there always has to be a mark of God. There has to be a mark of God first. So what is the mark of God? And, you know, my mindset was always in Ezekiel. But on Thursday, we went into the book of Exodus where we see God says, use this as a mark on your forehead and a mark on your hand. And how many people waste so many times? so much time doing timelines and trying to figure out the mark of the beast when they ought to be teaching people the mark of God. All right, so you can listen to Thursday's uh, service if you haven't. I advise you to get that. If you are on Facebook Live or anything and want that, just simply email charlotteisrael at gmail.com and I will make sure you get that particular service because it was a very, very important service about the mark, okay, about the mark of God. So, once again, I ask people, do you believe when Jesus says something, when he gives us a principle, like he tells, you can judge a person by his fruit, you judge a tree by his fruit. He's not talking about trees, he's talking about people. There are concepts. 
So when the disciples teach them, and this is important to understand, when the disciples go to him and say, teach us how to pray, he gives us the model of a prayer. Okay, and that's the disciples' prayer. We call it the Lord's Prayer, but it's really the disciples' prayer. And there's one part of that prayer that says, Lord, let it be what? On earth as it might be in heaven? No, on earth as it is in heaven. Okay, so if you're looking at earth as it is in heaven, remember the tabernacle. The tabernacle was an earthly model of a heavenly design. So therefore, okay, I want you to think about it. Let's go through, you know, even the book of Daniel. Remember, Daniel is fasting for 21 days. Okay, and finally the angel shows up and says, oh, Daniel, I was dispatched the first day. The, the minute you set your heart to set your heart towards God, I was dispatched with your, with your answer. I was held up for 21 days. War in heaven eventually represented what? War on earth. When that angel gave him the message, the next battle he was having was with Persia, who was the next, okay, once again, next government of Babylon. So we see that on earth as it is in heaven. If the battle is won in the heavens, okay, you'll see a battle won or lost on earth, depending on who's doing the battle. So if things are on earth as it is in heaven, all right, I want you to think about it. All right, I want you to think about this. Okay. On earth as it is in heaven, there's a heavenly court in the heavens. If a judgment has been made in the heavens on something, a judgment on the earth will be made on that very thing. It was first judged in the heavens based upon the evidence given by witnesses. And the heavens once again passed a judgment which can be carried out on earth. So when there is an earthly judgment, there has already been a heavenly judgment. And the heavenly judgment is always true. Why? Because who are the two witnesses? The heavens and the earth, they do not lie. They don't take bribes. They have no affiliation to anybody other than God. However, there are times, once again, if it has been judged in the heavens, then the judgment is passed down to be carried out by the hands of men. Now, there are times when the hands of men do not do just judgments. And we saw that. That is why when I woke up on Wednesday, I think it was, with Hosea chapter 4. What did Hosea chapter 4 talk about? You're not doing righteous judgment. And then he gives a whole list of criteria as to what is really going on that he sees. All right, that he sees. We are meant to be witnesses also, remember. But if the church doesn't understand what they are to judge and what standards they are to judge by, they will get all caught up in their emotions which is what was going on with me when I was going across the bridge and saying, why am I having this attitude when I never had this attitude before? We get caught up sometimes in our emotions of things instead of looking at things the way God does. God will always judge by the Torah. Are people having outrageous because Torah has been violated, God's word has been violated, or their flesh. You see, we will tend to make judgment that way, which do what? 
when judgment has been enacted on earth, then we are supposed to judge that thing by the same standards and reach the same conclusion because God does not make mistakes. You understand what I'm saying? His judgments are righteous. His judgments are righteous. And when we override a righteous judgment by God, there are going to be problems for us. Because then we take an adversarial position with God. And then when we take an adversarial position with God, he must judge us according to his word. So why are we continuing to have all of these weather things going on, tornadoes? God controls the wind. That could have been a gentle breeze or it could have been a Category 5 tornado. That could have been a gentle uh, rain or it could be a blizzard out of season. You understand what I'm saying? Why are we still having all of these things? So we look at judgments that are being done across the earth. Okay, because when God passes his judgments, when we read in Leviticus, soon we'll be reading in Leviticus 26, these things happen to do what? Get our attention and turn us back to the Torah. But if we do not turn back to the Torah, what happens to us? It gets worse. Now, let me tell you something, saints. The worst thing that could happen to us is that God stops judgments against us. And why do I say that? Because if that gets to the point where he does that, then that means there's nothing else to do. You've already been put in this particular box to be dealt with a certain way at a certain time. As long as he is still rendering punishments, there is always a hope that we will turn around, confess our sin, and come back to God. But there comes a time when there is a point of no return. And based upon the evidence that is given, either a righteous judgment will be entered into, or if it is an unrighteous judgment by man, make no mistake, it will be a righteous judgment by God. All right, we need to understand how these principles work because we are living them. I don't know about anyone else. I'm kind of sick and tired of some of the stuff that is going on that we are part of, okay, because we can't get it right. Let's just get things right, guys, okay? And when we get things right, that's why it's so important that we pray. Wherever you are, pray for the shalom of your city because in it, you will have shalom. All hell may be breaking loose next door. Okay, the city next door may have had a Category 5 tornado, but it did not come nigh your dwelling. You understand what I'm saying? Now, I'm not selfishly praying that everything be all right with me and everybody else can go to hell in a handbasket. I'm not saying that. But when you understand your assignment, and God gave us an assignment in Jeremiah 29, Pray for the city, build houses, marry, do these things, increase, do not decrease, because I got plans for you. God understands his assignment for us. Do we understand his assignment to us? Okay, if we don't understand that, there are going to be problems. All right, there are going to be problems. But right now, we are on a precipice. I will tell you, we are on a precipice as a nation. All right. And the one thing that we need to, to compare everything to, command everything to, is God's word. We were called into the kingdom for such a time as this. I kind of uh, um, got into it with our rabbi in uh, Sierra Leone over a couple, you know, over a couple of things. And then God, you know, uh, uh, quickly, I don't want to say he chastised me. He reminded me, your assignment is different than his. He is never going to see certain things the way you will, because that's not his assignment. 
And see, very often we wonder why people don't see things the way that we do. You understand what I'm saying? Maybe it's not their assignment. They don't have the same job as we do. So they will not have the same understanding about things that we do. You understand what I'm saying with that? That's why we have to take, once again, a step back a lot of times. All right. To look at things from a God's eye view so that we don't get caught up in something and mess up our assignments so that God has to deal with us to get us back on track. You understand? Sometimes what you're going through is because you step out of your assignment and he's trying to get you back into that. We're witnesses. We are to look. We are to observe. We are to see what God says. We are to speak when we are supposed to speak. We are to be the example. We are to be that holy nation, holiness according to God. Okay, not according to man. Not according to man's laws, but to his law. Because why? We are seated in heavenly places. You understand? Uh, we may be positioned here, but we are also positioned there. We can go boldly before the throne because of the blood of Yeshua. All right. I'm going to let Ed go ahead and teach about the Passover. And then I am going to come with the lesson. Okay. And the uh, name for today is, title for today is, I am redeemed. I am redeemed. Okay, Ed. Shabbat Shalom. This is Ed in Tampa. It's still about the lamb, Yeshua, the lamb of God. At first glance, Pasha Zab appears to simply repeat Pasha Vavikra. Both present the detailed laws concerning the five basic categories of Korbanat offering. That is the Ola, a burnt offering, the Minka, a meal offering, also the Kata, a sin offering, the Asham, a guilt offering, and the Shalamin, a peace offering. A more careful examination, however, reveals that these two portions differ, not only regarding the order of their presentation of the offering, but also with respect to their detail. Vayikra addresses instructions to the Israelites for offering the sacrifices. Zab addresses instructions to the coordinator of the priest as to how they are to be presented, how they present the sacrifices. Another subtle difference is that in last week's Parsha, Vayikra, God begins by commanding Moses. He says to Moses, speak or dabar. That's Hebrews 1696. Declare to the Israelite people and say to them, in this week's poor portion, that was in Leviticus 1-2. In this week's parsha, Zah, the Lord spoke to Moses, that's Leviticus 6, 1 through 2, command Aaron and his sons. Thus, indeed, Zah means to command or obligate. So last week it was speaking. This week it was it is commanding, that is obligating. Purposes of Karbanah. Contrary to popular lease, the purpose of Karbanah is not simply to obtain forgiveness from sin. Although many carbonate have the effect of expiating sin, there are many other purposes for bringing carbonate. And the expiratory effect is often incidental and is subject to significant limitations. Certain carbonate are brought purely for the purpose of communing with God and becoming closer to him. Others are brought for the purpose of expressing thanks to God, love, or gratitude. Others are used to cleanse a person of ritual impurity which does not necessarily have anything to do with sin. And yes, many carbonate are brought for the purpose of atonement. The atoning aspect of carbonate is carefully circumscribed. For the most part, carbonate only expiates unintentional sin. That is sin committed because a person forgot that this thing was a, was a sin. No atonement is needed for violations committed under the rest or through lack of knowledge and for the most part, Carbono cannot atone for malicious or deliberate sin. So back to that again. No atonement is needed for violations committed under the rest or through lack of knowledge. However, carbono cannot atone for malicious and deliberate sin. In addition, carbono has no expiating effect upon the person making the offering sincerely. If the person making the offering sincerely repents his or her action before the offering and makes restitution to any person who was harmed by the violation. So, if you don't make restitution or repent, 
Carbono has no expiated effect whatsoever. So let's go over this one more time. Let me repeat. Carbono only expiates unintentional sin. Carbono cannot atone for malicious, deliberate sin. Also, if there's no sincere heartfelt repentance and restitution, it doesn't matter what you bring. There is no atonement for your sin. So you can bring the biggest cow or bull from your flock. There's no atonement for your sin if your heart is not in the right condition, if you're not made resti to restitution, and if you're not bringing it in a heartfelt manner. Zob details a procedure regarding how the type of korban is offered. That is the basic difference between the Torah portion Zob and Vibrika in Leviticus. Whereas Zob deals primarily with the procedures for offering the various carbon mill, Vyrika focuses on which korban is to be offered under which circumstances. There are different types of carbon mill and the laws related to them are detailed and complicated. This section introduced some of the major types of carbon mill. There are many subtypes within these classification and other types do not, that do not fit into these categories. First, we have Ola, or the burnt offering. For best, best known class of offering, it is the burnt offering. It is the oldest and commonest sacrifice. In fact, we find an example of Ola that is burnt offering in Genesis 8, 22, 22, when and Noah built an altar unto the Lord and took of every clean beast and of every clean fowl and offered burnt offerings on the altar. And the Lord smelled a sweet savor. And the Lord said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground any more for man's sake, for the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I again smite it any, every living thing as I have done. So we see early on, we have an Ola often submitted by Noah. So it was the oldest and common sacrifice and represented submission to God's will. The Hebrew word for burnt offering is Ola from the root ayin lamet he, meaning ascension. It is the same root as aliyah, which is used to describe the moving to Israel or ascending to the podium to say a blessing over the Torah or ascending up to Jerusalem. And Ola is completely burnt on the outer altar. No part of it is eaten by anyone because the offering represents complete submission to God's will. The entire offering is given to God. In effect, it cannot be used after it is burnt. It expresses a desire to commune with God and expiate sins incidentally in the process. Because how can you commune with God if you're tainted with sin? An Ola could be made from cattle, from sheep, from goats, or even birds, depending on the offer's means. So, Zavat Shamin, that is the peace offering. A peace offering is an offering expressing thanks and gratitude to God for his bounties and mercies. The Hebrew term for this offering is Zabat Shalamin, or sometimes just Shalamin, which is related to the word Shalom, peace or whole. A represented portion of the offering is burnt on the offering, on the altar. The portion is given to the Kohanim and the rest is eaten by the offer and its family. Thus everyone gets part of this offering. This category of offering includes Thanksgiving offering in Hebrew, Torah, which is, was obligatory for survivors of life-threatening crisis. Free will offering, an offering made after fulfillment of a vow. So you've been in a near plane crash or your ship almost sunk or some disaster, you should give a Thanksgiving offering, a Torah. Now, the kata, or the sin offering. A sin offering is an offering to atone for and purge a sin. It is an expression of sorrow or error and the desire to be reconciled with God. The Hebrew term for this offering is called katat. And the word kaik, kat, means missing the mark. Katat can often be offered by unintentional sins committed through carelessness, not for again intentional or malicious sin. The size of the offering varied according to the nature of the sin and the financial means of the sinner. So once again, if your rich neighbor brings a bull to an offering, you know what kind of sin he's committed. Hmm. Some katat are individual and some are communal. Communal offerings represent the in interdependence of the community and the fact that we are all responsible for each other's sins. A few katat ought, could not be eaten for the most part for the average person's personal sin, katat was eaten by the Kohanim. Once again, we have another offering, the katat or sin offering, that cannot atone for intentional or malicious sin. Next, we have the asham, or the guilt offering. A guilt offering is an offering to atone for sins or stealing things from the altar. 
for when you are not sure whether you committed a sin, what sin you committed, or for the breach of trust. The Hebrew word for guilt often is asham. When there was doubt as to whether a person committed a sin, that person would make an asham rather than katat, because bringing a katat would constitute admission of a sin, and the person would have to be punished for it. If a person bought an asham and later discovered that he had in fact committed the sin, he will then have to bring a katat at that time. But the sham was eaten by the Kohanim. And we have food and drink offerings. A meal offering of Minka represents devotion of fruits of man's work to God. Because it was not a natural product, but something created to man's effort, it represented a piece of the offering was burned on the fire of the altar, but the rest was eaten by the Kohanim. There are also offerings of undiluted wine referred to as Neset. Now, finally, we have para aduma, that is the red heifer. According to Numbers 19, seven through eight, this offering requires the priest and the individual burning the offering to both wash their bodies and garments and remain unclean until evening. So this offering does not bring about cleanness, but it brings about uncleanness for the priest and for the person performing the burnt offering. The ritual of the red heifer in Hebrew, that is para adama, is part of one of the most mysterious rituals described in the Torah. The purpose of this ritual is to purify people from the defilements caused by contact with the dead. The ritual is discussed in Numbers 19. If you find it difficult to understand, don't feel bad. The sages describe themselves as described as being beyond human understanding. What is so interesting about this ritual is that it purifies the impure, but it also renders the pure impure. In effect, everybody who participates in this ritual becomes impure. We find that in Numbers 19, 1 through 2 and verse 10, the Lord said to Moshe and Aaron, this is a requirement of the law that the Lord has commanded. Tell the Israelites to bring you a red heifer without defect or blemish that has never been under yoke. This will be a lasting ordinance both for the Israelites and for the aliens living among them. Since 1967, there's been an a movement in Israel to rebuild the Holy Temple, destroyed in 70 AD. As of today, many preparations have been completed, such as priestly garments and sacred vessels. However, if a temple were rebuilt today, a red heifer would be required to restore biblical standards of purity. Numbers 19.4 states that Eleazar and the priest is to take some of the red heifer's blood on his finger and sprinkle it seven times toward the tent of meeting. Thus, an unblemished, pure red heifer is decreed key ingredient to temple worship. That's Numbers 19, one through two and verse 10. So before concluding, let's talk a little bit about red heifers. This is also in a warning to people who make timelines. You may have read in the paper or seen in the news several times that a red heifer had been found. Normally in this country, it's always found in Texas for some strange reason. People are implying that once you find the red heifer, the issue is coming. So they're setting up a timeline based on having a red heifer. So it is believed by many that this ritual will be formed by Messiah when he comes because we've all suffered the defilement of contact with the dead. Thus, the existence of a red heifer is, a, is possible, but not a definite sign of the Messiah. If the Messiah were coming, there would be a red heifer, but there could be a red heifer without Messiah coming. So don't get deluded when you hear about the discovery of a red heifer somewhere and the temple sacrifice can be done because you have a red heifer. There's no temple. We don't have a red heifer. The red heifer should be approximately three years old. Anyway, back to our reading. It is still about the lamb, Yeshua, the lamb of God. Shabbat Shalom. Ooh, praise the Lord. All right. Amen. 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 You know, Ed, thank you uh, for going into that about the Temple Institute. When I went over there back in, I think it was 2007, um, when, um, actually, no, it was before that. The first time that I went, I went to Temple Institute, uh, with Brother Wolf. I was with Brother Wolf and, uh, uh, the UPC. I have some pictures. I found some pictures when I was moving. I have to, uh, see if I can scan them. All right. And, uh, of my trip over, over to, uh, uh, Israel back then, you know, but, uh, um, what is the real reason why people are so excited about the red heifer? One of the things that I'm trying to figure out, and like Ed said, every time you turn around, the red heifer, heifer is coming out of Texas, okay? So I'm wondering, are these cows natural born or are they hybrid? 
Are they manipulated by man or are they pure by God? You understand what I'm saying? Because you can manipulate, okay, genes to produce what it is you want. But that doesn't mean it's all natural according to God. You understand what I'm saying? So it wouldn't surprise me if some of them are hybrid for one reason. Because remember, everybody is so excited about this next temple. But this next temple, according to the book of Revelation, is what? It's not the temple that you want to be associated with. So wouldn't it make sense that a hybrid red heifer or a hybrid messiah, okay, would come along? It makes absolutely perfect sense, okay, with that. Now, what is the real reason why everybody in church is so excited, okay, so excited about all of this? Because once again, it's supposed to represent the rapture is on the way. The rapture is coming and church will be gone and we'll be leaving these Jews down here to get their heads chopped off by the Antichrist. Well, thanks for the love. <laughs> okay. <laughs> if you really love me that much, are you willing to stay here and help me? You know, come on. Let's, let's look at what people really believe. And if you really believe that, there's a problem. There's a problem, really, that people don't talk about what happens when that doesn't happen you are going to turn against the very ones you say you love there is such of an anti-semitic spirit going on right now we see that the war with the woman remember in uh revelation chapter 12 we have the woman with the 12 stars and all of that okay so we're seeing that war in the heavens if there's a war in the heavens against Israel, what do you think there's going to be on earth? Right. If the nations of, say, Gog and Magog, and we always say that the nations of Gog and Magog are like Russia. Anyone ever hear that? That Russia is part of that? So if there is going to be a Gog and Magog war with Russia in the heavens, should I be looking for Russia in a war on earth? Certainly, certainly. Okay, a war that may start off small and next thing you know, it involves the whole world. You understand what I'm saying? That's why I keep saying to everyone, pay attention, pay attention, pay attention on earth as it is in heaven. We get so caught up in our day-to-day, day-to-day, day-to-day that we are not paying attention, okay, to certain things, okay, that are going on. And I'm not saying don't build no religion, saying I'm saying that this is the end times, the timeline is here and all that kind of stuff. I'm just telling you what Yeshua said. When you see these things, these are the beginning, okay? So if something has a beginning, it is going to have a finale. And that they're going to be like birth pangs and that they are going to get more severe as time goes on. Okay? But also during that time, once again, he says, hey, don't be deceived. Deception. The enemy's weapon that he will use against the church is deception. Because that's what he was. Okay? Remember, it is the woman who named him as the deceiver. The serpent deceived me. So if you're a deceiver, rather, if you deceive people, what are you? You're a deceiver, okay? Because she saw him as a deceiver. But we also know Yeshua says he was a murderer from the beginning, okay? And people get that confused, all right? I had to, uh, as a matter of fact, I went to a... Uh, um, uh, pastor, I don't want to say pastor, Dr. Natorkin's fiance, okay, is a pastor. I went to his uh, uh, church, when was it, on uh, Sunday because they were having a special program for a musician that is a orchestra musician and all that kind of stuff. You know me, I like musicians and all that. So anyway, they had a little quiz. He had someone come up and give quiz questions, all right? And one of the questions was, what was the name of Satan from the beginning? Okay, and so, you know, I said, oh, he was a murderer. They gave the choices. Murderer was one of them. I said a murderer. Deceiver was a choice. The book actually had the answer deceiver. And I said, eh, wrong answer. Okay. 
according to John, I think it is eight. Okay, he was a murderer from the beginning. Okay, so think about it. Why murderer and not deceiver when he's called a deceiver? All right. All right. Hmm? Lie, the other one's dead. Yeah. A murderer. Think about murder. When someone goes to murder someone, that is usually a deliberate act. It is pre-thought of. It's different than if you have a fight with someone, you wound them and they die. You killed them. That's why the law makes provision for, you know, unintentional killing and the cities of refuge. You may have killed them, but it's not considered murder. Murder is when you are deliberately sitting back thinking of how you're going to kill someone. You understand what I'm saying? The enemy was a murderer from the beginning. Why do we know that? Because he understood the consequences of Adam and Eve doing what? Eating the fruit. That's why he chose that as a weapon. That's just like someone telling you, here's a gun. Okay, here's a gun. You know, point it at your temple. All right, and pull the trigger. It's not loaded. And you point it at your temple and pull the trigger. And, oops, I forgot that one bullet. Okay, but in the meantime, you know, okay, you know that that was no accident nine times out of ten. Okay, nine times out of ten. You just wanted to make it look like they killed themselves. But you always knew there was at least one bullet in that gun. You were depending upon the person not knowing what your intentions were. Remember, the serpent was very beautiful. They were in charge, Adam and Eve was in charge of the garden. They were not anticipating an enemy from within. An enemy from within that had what? A secret agenda against them. That's why he was a murderer. He understood what eating that fruit would do and, and, and that it would cause them to die. Cause them to die. Okay, so when we look at these different principles that we're talking about, I want to talk about a principle that led me to this title, I Am Redeemed. We are getting ready for our Pesach Seder, our Passover Seder uh, this week, Wednesday, 7.30, guys. Wednesday at 7, we always have it at 7.30 anyway, but uh, it'll be this Wednesday at 7.30, and we will be both live here at Rich and uh, Lena's and then all of you guys online. Uh, Pastor Millie will not be joining us this year because she got grown, okay? And she wants to do one herself with the congregation, okay? So that's what happens when they get grown. They start pulling away and want to do their own themselves, okay? So that's fine. That's good for good for them because the more we can branch out, okay, we can branch out uh, uh, with that. We will probably have, you know, a visitor. Tom wants to come. Okay, and so anyway, it's always good to have at least one new person, okay, one who hasn't experienced it, okay, together, okay, because they're going to want, they're going to be curious about it. For us, Passover is a time of joy and time of thanksgiving, okay, it is, and the Pesach offering, why are we so thankful to God, okay, why is Passover so special? That's one thing that I was trying to impress upon them today at the uh, at the youth facility. And if you remember, uh, and I didn't open up with the Passover uh, scriptures in the Old Testament, I went over to 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse number 6. Your glory is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump? Purge out therefore the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened. For even Mashiach, Christ, Messiah, our Passover is sacrifice. So if Christ is the Passover sacrificed in the New Testament, who was the one in the Old Testament about? Same one. In that the if the one in the Old Testament is about Yeshua, then it's always been about Yeshua. Now, let me say that again. 
it's always been about Yeshua. I'm going to say it one more again. Okay. It's always been about Yeshua. That's why sometimes I will begin in the New Testament because I found out today, I said, I have some Bibles, okay, to give out. And I heard them say, we don't give up Bibles with the Old Testament. And it was like emoji face. Okay, because how do they get a fullness of the entire Bible if they only have half the Bible to learn from? We start at the book of John. If you really start at the book of John, you really need to start at the book of Genesis. Okay, because John is the Genesis, okay, of the New Testament. That's where you know who Yeshua is. Okay, so anyway, that's another story, another time. So what makes this night so special? What is it? about the Pesach offering that makes this night different. And we don't really think about that. We just go through the Passover, we go through it, you know, we get through the Seder and all that. Let's eat. <laughs> okay, that's really what we do. We go through it and everything. Let's eat. Who brought the baklava? Okay, is that you want to bring a baklava? Sherry is not going to be here this year. Okay, so do we have a dessert? I think Connie's going to bring a dessert. Okay, so you see what's important on my mind, okay? You know, but anyway, what makes this night different? We do special things on this night. It's the Passover. This represents something very important to us. So, now, one thing we need to understand with this. God did not just take us out of Egypt. He did not just take us out of Egypt. He did something else for us also. He redeemed us. He redeemed us. Okay. I want to go for a moment to Exodus chapter 6. Let's go to Exodus chapter 6. I start in verse number 2. It's the Torah portion by Era. By Era. Elohim spoke to Moses and said to him, I am Yahweh. That's Levit. I'm not sorry, not Leviticus. Exodus chapter 6, verse 2, we start. Elohim spoke to Moses and said to him, I am Yahweh. I appear to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as El should die, but I did not make myself known to them by my name, Yahweh. Did they, did they know the name of Yahweh? Yes, they did. But that word known is related to an experience. Remember, with every covenant, there's usually a covenantal name for the experience that you will have with him. And you shall call his name Yeshua. Yahweh becomes Yeshua. What is he going to do now? For he shall save his people from their sin. So that is our experience with Yahweh. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob knew him as El Shaddai, the one who provides. But you are going to know me as Yahweh, my name. I am what I am, okay? I will be or I will become what I am becoming, okay? You know, and he became what to us? Eventually, he became Savior, the Lamb of God. Okay, and that is one of the most important terms you will ever learn when John identifies him as the Lamb of God. There's only one sacrifice that is the Lamb of God, and that's the Passover. You have other lambs that were sacrificed to God, but it is only the Pesach that Yahweh says, this is my sacrifice. Why? Because it points to him. This is me, the Lamb. We see him in the book of Revelation as what? The lamb. He's before the throne as the lamb. So it's from Genesis all the way through Revelation. It's always been about the lamb. And if you don't know that, then this is why people sometimes don't get into the holy days of God. They don't understand them. They don't understand the reason why. Why do we begin with Pesach? Okay? So continue reading in uh, Exodus. I also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, the land in which they lived as sojourners. So uh, Jacob, 
I don't care if you bought Shechem, okay? I don't care if you settled in the land, okay? Remember, we talked about that on Thursday. You may have settled in the land, but your timeline was wrong about going back and settling in the land. That's why you had so much trouble. That's why your daughter got raped. Your son wound up marrying all these people. Okay, your other son, okay, they almost killed him, sent him to Egypt. Why? Because your timeline was wrong. You didn't understand the assignment. Okay, now, once again, when we look at things in our understanding, that's why I say you need to, you really need to go over Thursdays, okay, service to understand where I am coming from, okay, with this in these timelines. Verse 5, this is important. Because this is why we can love him so. I have now heard the groaning of the Israelites. Do I have any Israelites in the house? So by him saying this, do you think he understands he hears us when we are sad? He hears us when we are crying? Yes, he says it here. I have heard the moaning of the Israelites. And if I'm an Israelite, he hears me. God has said he hears me. Why? Because the Egyptians are holding them in bondage. And I have remembered my covenant. The worst thing you could want if you mess with an Israelite is for God to remember. You pray he developed dementia or Alzheimer's. <laughs> okay, <laughs> forget. Okay, because we see the end of the story about those who keep on messing with Israel. It never works out well. Even if, this is the strange, even if God appoints you to mess with Israel, like he did Babylon and Persia, okay, and the Medes, he still gets you, okay? He still gets you in the end because guess what? He used you because he knew you wanted to mess with them anyway. But then he's going to get you in the end because you messed with him. Mess with them. You mess with them more than what he intended you to mess with them for. He gave you a chance to show mercy and you did not show mercy. You understand what I'm saying? Okay, my people went into Egypt under, not under false pretenses. You took them in and then what you do, who wound up doing to them? There must be payment to my people. So when we are under bondage, God will remember that covenant. You know why in some cases he hasn't come back, guys? Because the moaning is not enough. We get comfortable, okay? I'm a little uncomfortable, <laughs> okay? And then something happens, someone gives you an ice cream cone and you're all back again. I'm happy again for a while. And then we get uncomfortable again. But when it gets to the point where you can't take anymore and you start moaning and groaning and asking God, all of us together, how you are mistreat, how they are mistreating us, and we come together as one voice. You're going to hear us. You're going to see him begin to react in a different way. He said, "Say therefore to the Israelite people, do I have any Israelites in the house? If the answer is yes, who is he speaking to? Us. I am Yahweh. I will free you from the labors of the Egyptians." and deliver you from their bondage. I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and through extraordinary chastisement. And I will take to you to be my people and I will be your Elohim. And you shall know that I, Yahweh, am your Elohim who freed you from the labors of the Egyptians. And I will bring you to the land which I swore to give Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob I will give it to you as a possession, I, Yahweh. So when we... I don't know what happened. Did you hear anything I said? Okay, I was reading the scriptures. Okay, we were reading. Quick grief. I don't know how that muted. Okay, it got muted. 
Okay, maybe somebody has some background noise and you muted everybody. Okay, sorry. All right, well, I was reading the scriptures from Exodus once again, two all the way through. Where did I go? Okay, yeah, all the way through eight. Yeah, it just happened again. Okay, it, uh, can, you know, can you make maybe uh, the host, the yes. co host? Yes. Yeah, well, well, let me see. Okay. Okay, so uh, all right, that should be fine then. All right, so I don't know why it was doing that, but anyway. Okay, so we celebrate Passover, we have four cups that we drink. Everybody knows, okay, four cups, okay? Each one represents one of the statements that we just read in Exodus chapter 6, all right? And he used those, okay, to express his commitment to deliver us from Egypt. So, one, I will take you out of Egypt. You know what is wonderful? Egypt, let's get a split mind. Egypt is a type and shadow of sin. Remember, Pharaoh is a type and shadow of Hasatan because he's an oppressor. He oppresses people, okay? He puts people in bondage, all right? So Egypt is a type and shadow of sin. So you can just put next to Egypt sin right there. Why? Because we, once again, if it's always about Yeshua, it's always about Yeshua, all right? It's easy to talk to people about Passover when it's always been about Yeshua to begin with, all right? Number two, first, I will take you out of Egypt. Sin. I will save you from your terrible labors. That's that oppression that we have been under, okay? Number three, I will bring you to me as a people and take you to the land. But the fourth one is, I will redeem you. I will redeem you. Now, it's very easy for us to understand the first three, okay? But what does it really mean? What does number four really mean? To be redeemed, to be redeemed, okay? And as someone uh, mentioned there, it means to be saved. No, it isn't. Salvation and redemption are two different things. Oh, that's not what we learned in church. Well, we didn't learn a whole lot in church, <laughs> okay? <laughs> we didn't learn a whole lot. In fact, we had to unlearn some things, okay, that we learned in church. So let's talk about this. Now, this became, I wanted to go to bed at 10 o'clock last night, okay? I wanted to go to bed at 10 o'clock last night. It didn't work out that way. I think I wound up going to bed at about one because I just started writing and writing and writing. And it's like, I tried to, I put the book up, I cr cut off the light and I got into bed and all I could hear is get up. <laughs> okay, <laughs> and so I finished writing what I had to write. And so I was so tired. Like you said, today was so hard to get up out of bed. <laughs> all right, I was so tired. Okay, but it was worth it. So let me say this. Whenever you go through a trauma, can we admit the Israelites were in a trauma, traumatic situation? 210 years, okay, in Egypt, most of that in bitter bondage. Have any of you ever gone through trauma before? I mean, extreme trauma. Yes, we have, okay? Whenever you go through a trauma, it is not just enough to be saved from that trauma. Why? because that trauma will leave a mark on you. When you go through a trauma, say for example, you get scared by a dog. Every time you hear a dog barking from now on, you're afraid. There are people who are afraid, grown men who are afraid of itchy, okay? Because they had a bad experience as a child with a dog, okay? Doesn't matter whether it is a pit bull, doesn't matter whether it's a chihuahua. When they hear a dog bark, it reminds of that trauma that they went through, okay? So it is not just enough to be saved from the trauma, okay? Because it leaves its mark. 
You need to be made whole. Okay, think about it. Trauma leaves a, a hole in you, H-O-L-E. If you get saved from the trauma, you still have that hole, right? You need to have that hole filled in. That's what it means by being made whole. Okay, being made whole, okay? Even more so when that trauma is because of something you did. Whether bad, was it a bad decision, a wrong decision? I want you to think about it. Sometimes the trauma we go through is because of a decision that we made. Maybe I shouldn't have had that relationship. You understand what I'm saying? People tried to warn me, <laughs> okay, but I didn't listen. Maybe I shouldn't take that job. Maybe I shouldn't have gone that way. You understand? I shouldn't have gone to that party. Maybe I shouldn't. Okay, think about it. What happens when you have trauma because the trauma is because of a decision you made? It's even worse sometimes. It's even worse sometimes. It's not enough in that situation for someone to come along and go, Poop, you're now saved. All right. No, it's not enough for that to happen because remember, trauma leaves a mark. It leaves a mark. It's a situation, okay, that you need to be redeemed. It's in those type of situations, especially when the trauma is caused by something that was done to you, whether it was by you or someone else, that you need to be redeemed. I want you to think about it. If we were in sin, was that sin involuntary or voluntary most times? Voluntary. Voluntary. Okay. All right. If we don't understand that, then why did you go up to the altar? Okay. That's that. Come on. Why did we feel that guilt? We recognize that what? We did something wrong that there was a hole in our soul, okay, let's say, and we needed, we needed someone or something to help us pull us up out that hole. Can we think of anyone else that was ever put in a hole? Joseph. Oh, here we go, goats and goats. Okay, okay. Why are we in Egypt right now to begin with? goats and coats joseph because we put someone in a hole we betrayed our brothers we lied to our fathers we even thought about murder okay murder we sold them into slavery we heard his cries in that hole and we went to lunch okay that's why you see so much guilt in the end with the brothers. Okay, the guilt, that trauma behind everything that happened. So how do you become whole when wounds that you are suffering may have come from your actions and your actions alone? I want you to think about the brothers again. After Joseph reveals himself and goes away, don't they stop fussing at each other? I told you not to do. I told you this would happen. <laughs> okay. They start, even though Joseph knew them, said, don't fight now. I don't want you fighting. The minute he closed the door, they started fighting with each other. I told you this was going to happen to us. Okay. Didn't we tell you when he was crying not to? Here, oh, there you go. You, you oh yeah, it. okay. All right, I'm going to have to pay attention to the screen here. All right, so it is in these cases when the trauma we've experienced is from actions of our own that we really need to be redeemed. And how does that happen? We need to face the source of the wound. Okay, we need to come to grips with why we are wounded in the first place. Now, can anyone think of a scripture? Let me see here. 
if we confess our sin. When we confess our sin, we are coming what? Face to face with the cause of that trauma. We need to look at what we did, okay, to make that trauma happen. Not just to look at what we did, but to actually go through it again, but this time choose a different ending. How many times when you go through trauma, okay, do you go through it and say, what if I had done this instead? What if I had done that instead? You know, you go through that guilt and everything because you didn't. See, we don't teach people how to get rid of guilt. That's why the Asham offering is a guilt offering. When you recognize guilt, come to me, bring an offering. I'll take away that guilt. Remember what you are doing with that sacrifice. You bring that sacrifice and what do you do? You lay your hands on it. What was on you gets transferred to the sacrifice. You get their innocence, they get your guilt. Slay the sacrifice. Okay? And that is that atonement for that. All right. But then sometimes God will remind you, or always remember, when you don't know how to get rid of guilt, this is why people sometimes become suicidal. Because their guilt is so great, no one gives them a remedy for how to absolve that guilt. You understand what I'm saying? This is why the book of Leviticus is so important because God gives us a resolution. There are times when something will come up. Why? Because God says, you know, this is in the back of your mind. Every single action you are taking, you don't even realize you are taking this action because of this thing that traumatized you, that you still feel guilty about, whether you admit it or not. This is why you are doing this. So I'm going to bring this to your front again so that once and for all, we can deal with it. We can deal with it. And so you go through that, you choose a different ending. I go to the altar. I admit I did wrong. I admit I made the wrong decision and took the wrong action about this. But I give that, confess that, and give it to God so that the next time I'm in that situation, guess what? I have the power to make the right decision. Okay, again. All right. Redemption is not just for you to replay your history, but guess what? To redeem your history, to repair it, to make yourself stronger. What's that song? What doesn't kill you makes you stronger. How many of us, and I'm, I'm going to raise my hand. When Dorian died, I thought I was going to... Yeah, you, there you go. Okay. All right. When Dorian passed away, I could feel my soul leaving my body. I really could. I just, that's how I want it. The grief was so, so, so deep. And mothers who have lost a child, you know what I'm talking about. You know, you know what I'm talking about with that. The grief was so deep that I thought I would just leave here. It was easier for me to leave this earth than it was to stay with the pain that I was feeling that there was no comfort. Now, another thing to know, I learned this from, I learned this actually from uh, um, Dr. LaTorch's fiance, who is also a grief counselor. When we someone see someone grieving and crying, what is our first impression for us to go and do? To hug them, right? And we think we're giving them comfort, right? But we're actually harming them because we're not allowing them to go through the grief process. Why do we do that? When we hug them, it immediately says to them, that's enough. 
See, it's because we can't handle their grief that we try to go over and stop them. But sometimes it's just you need to let them get that out of their system. Let them cry. Let them scream. Be there when they are finished. But too often we short circuit somebody by going over and immediately hugging them. That hug was not for them. That hug was because we were uncomfortable with what they were going through. We didn't know how to handle it. So what did we do? Put a stop to it. You understand? Something very valuable, okay, as a grief counselor. Okay, so when we redeem our history, the purpose of redemption is to repair, to make us stronger, to make us whole again. All right, when you break something and you repair it, sometimes the repair can make that thing stronger than it was before so that it doesn't break in that area again. It could be weaker, but to repair it assumes I'm bringing it back to a whole, okay, a whole purpose, all right. That's what God gave us the chance to do with the Pesach offering. It makes us, the Pesach offering actually makes us face the fact why we were in Egypt in the first place. Why were we in Egypt in the first place? We behave, we what? Betrayed our brother, sold him into slavery. Then we wonder why after we get there, we're into slavery. Okay. We hated our brother. Why did we hate him? We hate him because he was something that we weren't. Isn't that the spirit of jealousy? Jealousy will make you do some crazy thing. Why were they jealous of him? Because they wanted to be the firstborn. They did everything that they did because they wanted to be the firstborn. And guess what? Jacob put that quote on him saying, Joseph is my firstborn. You may have been born before him, but I only recognize Joseph as my firstborn. Why? Because remember, he was tricked into marrying Leah. His wife, according to him, was Rachel, was Rachel. So Rachel's firstborn to him was his only legal firstborn. Abraham, I know you lay with Hagar and have Ishmael, but I want you to take your only son, Isaac. You understand what I'm saying? Okay, so the brothers, how do you think they felt about Joseph? being identified as the firstborn. Were they, oh, 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 glad for you. No, they wanted to kill him. In fact, they would have. They tried. Okay, so the Pesach offering brings us to why are we here in the first place? It makes us recognize the horror of what we did to our brother, Joseph. In selling him into slavery, we betrayed our brother, we lied to our father, we caused some despair, and what are we? Okay, have a Pharaoh who did what? Lied to us, shrewdly manipulated us, oppressed us, hey, measure for measure. What we did to our brother wound up being done to us. You understand what I'm saying? We don't look at Passover from that aspect, okay? We always look at Passover, well, Genesis chapter 15 says that we will be in, okay, a land not ours, we will go into oppression and they will enslave us and we always just look at that superficially. We don't look at how we got there 
what happened to get us there. And it all was because of a striped coat and the blood of a goat. The blood of a goat. Okay, once again, goats and goats. So what we do, we can't just, okay, ignore it. We can't just sweep it underneath the carpet. Okay, can't just put it in a drawer, in a closet. We are here because of certain actions that we took. Yes, there was a famine in the land. Yes, okay, God told Jacob to go there. Okay, but God told Jacob to go there because who was already there? Joseph. He was there. Okay, he was there. And when you found out that Joseph was there, immediately, okay, you went, <laughs> we, immediately, you went, we went into guilt. See, that's the whole thing. We forget about Genesis, the end of Genesis, and what the brothers felt when we get to Exodus. We only think about getting out of Egypt. We forget that the brothers understood why we are here and why Joseph, if he had an issue against us, he was rightfully having an issue. We, it reminded us of everything that we did to Joseph and everything that we did to our father. All right. Using goats once again and coats. Remember, Yahweh gave us an instruction. You're going to kill a lamb or a goat and you're going to keep your coats. <laughs> okay, this time you're going to keep your coats. You're going to keep your coats on. Okay. We replay all of these events. But each this time, we have a different ending. We really have a different ending. This time, okay, it is as if <clears throat> when we, okay, go out of Egypt, do we go by ourselves? We don't go by ourselves. When we were in the pit of despair, when we got out of Egypt, not only did we, did we not go by ourselves, but we took others with us this time we pulled our brothers out of the pit so the passover seder okay not only does god reveal how he redeemed us but he allows us to replay the actions that brought us down to egypt in the first place the sale of joseph we replay what happened why it happened our part in making it happen and why did we do it in the first place? Because of jealousy. We want it to be father's firstborn child. Keep that in your mind. We want it to be the firstborn. Didn't Reuben want to be the firstborn? He was the firstborn. He was born before Joseph. Everything he did was because he wanted to be the firstborn. He lay with his father's. Okay, why? After Rachel died. Why? Because the firstborn, once again, gets that double portion of everything. Okay, so there is a reason why he did the actions that he did. We did what we did to Joseph. We wanted to be father's firstborn. And how do you redeem that? We wanted to be special. We wanted to be something that we weren't. And we were willing to do anything to do that. It's just like those kids. Kids somewhat do sometimes crazy stuff because they're trying to prove a point to someone. They're trying to be something they weren't. Come on, how many times have we been bragging and all of this? We were trying to make ourselves look good in the eyes of others. All right, but it really was just a sham, okay? People sometimes are willing to deceive. They betray, they abuse. We've been disappointed by people. We've been disappointed by our parents, teachers, ministers. Okay, and what winds up happening? What did we just read? God said, look, I see where you're at. I see not only where you're at, but I see why you're there. Okay, and I'm here. He looked at us in our wretched condition. And what does he say to us? You don't have to do all that to be firstborn because you forget who your daddy is. I am your father. Where's that, uh, uh, star, uh, that star Wars voice? Okay, I am your father. <laughs> okay, I am your father. Okay. Darth Vader. Darth Vader, I am your father. Okay, we forget. What did God tell Moses? I think it was in, uh, what was it? In, uh, come on here. 
You're you're muted again. I don't know why it keeps on doing that. All right. What does he tell him? All right. In Exodus chapter four, he goes in verse number two. Then you, uh, 22, I'm sorry. Exodus four, verse 22. Then you shall say to, Mo, to Pharaoh, thus says Yahweh, Israel, do I have any Israelites? Israel is my firstborn son. Israel is my son. He's my firstborn son. I have said to you, let my son go that he may worship me. Yet you refuse to let him go. Now I will kill your firstborn son. So what is Passover kind of? It's about how we weren't the firstborn, but how we become what? The firstborn when we become a what? Nation. Right. When we become a nation. He reminds us that he is our father and we can be his firstborn. And that is what Passover is all about. How we become the firstborn of God. But remember, it wasn't going to be easy. What did we have to do? We had to take a lamb, right? A lamb or a goat. You're uh, mute. Oh, oh, never mind. You're choking. Okay. All right, we had to take a lamb or a goat. But um, weren't lambs or goats gods of the Egyptians? Yes, they were. We had to slay that lamb or goat, which was a god of the Egyptians, in front of them. Then we had to put the blood of that lamb or goat that was their god on our doorpost okay think about it up the sides and over the top up the sides and over the top that was an affront to the that's just like thumbing putting your thumb in somebody that's just like insulting someone at the highest level i just killed your god what you going to do about it so the Egyptians were none well pleased. See, we romanticize the lamb and we romanticize the blood, but we don't fully understand what it was that we were doing. God said, I'm going to call you out. You're going to be my firstborn, but it's not going to be easy. Remember, he told Moses, after this thing, they're going to thrust you out. They not only thrust them out because of the death of the firstborn, they thrust us out because we, as an affront to them, killed their God in front of them. All right? Lamb or goat to slaughter, place the blood on the doors. All right? As a firstborn, once again, we had to be an example. That's what firstborn, the oldest are always supposed to be an example. All right? That example does what? Teach the other children in the family. What do we do when we have a Passover Seder? We're teaching. We're teaching children. If we have a guest, we're teaching them. If we have a family member that's never been there, we're teaching them. We're bringing them all into the family through what? The blood. The blood of what? Yeshua the lamb of God. It's always been about the lamb, okay? We, through the Passover, teach them what? How to be obedient, how to obey the commandments of our father, all right? So if God is our father, he has children, right? If he's our father, then we also have brothers. He has children, they're our brothers. I want you to think about it. Not only did the natural born israelites come out of egypt but who else came out others we're muted oh okay okay we have he has other children we have other brothers who are part of our family this is what the passover seder what passover is all about all right just like when tom asked 
to come to the Seder. What were we going to say? No. We have to find a spot for them. Yeah, you know. We have to reach out. We have to pull other people into this Seder. This is why I encourage you that if you have it at home, don't have it by yourself. You guys, once again, if the lamb is too small for a house, go find somebody like Katrina going over to, okay, Renee. Or then pull your family in. Pull in her mother and father and all that. Bring them all so that there is a lamb in the house. All right? All right? That night, when we become the firstborn, guess what we do? We start turning our back on a lot of the deception, okay, that we've been through, all right? When we put the blood on the doorpost, we are screaming out to the entire universe that God is our father and we are his firstborn. Now, I want you to think about that. All right, I want you to think about that very carefully. All right, when we slew the Passover lamb, we put the blood on the doorpost. We were commanded not to go out until a certain time. We were commanded to kill the lamb, okay, or goat, but we were also commanded to prepare it in a certain way. We had to roast it and not boil it, am I right? But we had to roast it in a certain position. Its head and its knees had to be tied together. You remember, you're looking at, you don't remember that part, do you? Let's go to Exodus chapter 12. Oh, no, no, no. Okay. All right. And you're you're muted again. All right. Uh, hold on here. Lord knows I should have underlined it. Um. All right, he commands us to roast it. Hold on, let me see. Okay, in verse number three, he says, speak to the whole community of Israel. Say on that 10th of the month, we choose a lamb. We also know that if the lamb is too small for the household, we bring somebody else into the household. Okay, we keep watch over it until the 14th day, and then we slaughter it at twilight. Okay, we eat it in verse number seven. Let's look at verse number seven. They shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and the lintel of the houses in which they are to eat it. They shall eat the flesh that same night. They shall eat it roasted over fire with unleavened bread and with bitter herbs. Okay, I'm looking for a particular. It's me mad when I can't find what it is that I'm looking for. Where? Oh, okay. Didn't get there. All right. Do not eat any of it raw or cooked with any water, but roast it. Head, legs, and entrails. Your head, the legs, and the entrails. They know when they sacrificed it, they kind of wrapped it around the spit. All right. So that the head and legs were together. And when you look at that, isn't it like a fetal position? It's a fetal position. I want you to think about this. Because Yeshua is giving us kind of a hint in Matthew chapter 24. He starts talking about the tribulation that's coming. And that tribulation is like what? Birth pangs. It's like birth pangs. Okay, so here we have a lamb. All right, we're inside the house. The door is covered in blood. We get this call from out. Everybody rushes out the house through the blood. And we go from being a group of individuals 
to be born as a nation. How is a baby born? It come out through what? The blood. Through the blood. See, that's why in studying the Bible also culturally, knowing how they prepared the sacrifices and everything is very also very important. The picture that I saw when I saw that lamb, I said that lamb is in a fetal position. When they go out through the door, the door is like a womb. When they come out the door, they go from being one status to being the firstborn, where they are born again as a nation. They go from being individuals to be born again as a nation. Then when I saw that, I understood what Yeshua was talking to Nicodemus about. Nicodemus, you need to be born again. You're a teacher of the Torah. Why don't you understand that? Because the original born again where Israel became a nation was when they were born through the Passover and it was through the blood of the lamb that they go through to go from being a people into a nation of firstborn of God. And what are we called in the New Testament? The firstborn. All right, when we come through Yeshua. Remember, the Passover lamb is about Yeshua. When he is crucified, it's still about as our Passover lamb. So you must relate what happened to him on the cross with the original Passover. If you're going to be born again, if there is a born again experience over here, there had to be a born again experience over here. Now, why does God change the time in Exodus chapter 12 and tell us that this is going to be the new time for us? It's the time of our freedom, right? No. It's our birthday. It's the time of our birth. Your uh, mute is still past. What is our birthday? When we come out at Passover, a free people, just like a baby in the womb, when they come out, what is the first thing they do? They start wiggling around. They're free. No more bound up in the womb. They're, they're firstborn. They hand to the mother. They hand to the father. We became the firstborn of God. Our first birth or born again experience was not with Yeshua in the New Testament. It was with Yeshua on the original Passover. That's when we were born and we became Israel. Mixed multitude, we became the nation of Israel. So Nicodemus, I don't really understand why you don't understand being born again. Because if you're a teacher of the Torah, all right, you should fully understand the birth of us as a firstborn nation. We became whole as a firstborn. Joseph was the firstborn before, but when you are born again as Israel, we all become the firstborn of God, our Father. Do I have any Israelites in the house? Do you understand that Israel, as the firstborn of God, the firstborn gets what? Double. They get the double portion of everything and when we come through as the firstborn of god through the lamb of god it redeems us from our experience in egypt we are set free from egypt free from pharaoh who was hasatan to be able to freely go and worship 
God. And where was the church founded? Around Mount Sinai. Guess what? When we get around Mount Sinai, we're still the firstborn, but now we become the bride. Hallelujah. We become the bride. So with Passover, it's more than just a Seder, okay? It's how we begin to become redeemed. It's how we begin to ex understand that born again experience. It's when we understand God gave us a new time because that time represents our birth of a nation. It represents our birthday where we can forget about, listen, the baby forgets about the womb when they're born. Okay, they have to what? When a baby comes out the womb, you have to cut the cord and you start feeding the baby a different way. And then eventually the baby grows and the baby can do what? Feed itself. And then eventually the baby grows and next thing you know, they're grown up, married and producing more babies. Okay, going through the cycle again. So it's all a matter, do you understand your birth as the firstborn of God did not begin at that altar, as we were told, it began when we were born as a nation through the original Passover lamb in Egypt. All he was doing was just showing us how it would be done. Guess what? There's a mixed multitude also. That means there are those who were not Israelites that we are pulling up out the pit with us. Okay, that can be born again. It's all about the born again experience. It's all about being the lamb. It's all about Yeshua being the lamb. There is not one time when Yeshua was not the lamb. He was as much the lamb on that Passover spit as he is the lamb of God on the cross. So if you don't understand Passover, once again, Passover teaches you, you are redeemed. It teaches you, you are set free. It teaches you, you that he is your God. It teaches you, you are his son. You are free, you are redeemed. You have been delivered through what? The Passover lamb. The Seder is simply a reminder of, yes, we were in sin. Yes, we got ourselves in a mess that we did. There were reasons why we tried to kill our brother. We tried to betray, we were deceivers. But now we've been born again, and now we can. You're actually uh, frozen on our end. Are you there still? Her internet probably went out, Brad, or something, because it's frozen, so. Yeah. Okay, we just hold off for them to come back on. All right, we're back, we're back. We disappeared for a minute. I'll tell you. And we don't want you to know, understand about your born again experience. You wanna know why? Because if you understand it for yourself, you can go explain it to someone else, okay? If you understand it for yourself, you can pull some other people up out of the pit that are in a pit that don't know how to get out of it, 
okay? People who are in guilt, people who are in sin. If you understand yourself, what Passover is about, how you became the firstborn and God gave you a new birthday, a new birthday. This is the month of our birth. This is why he changed the time for us because we were to be born again. We never understood the born again experience from Passover. We weren't taught that. Come on, we weren't taught that. But if it was about Yeshua on the cross and a born again experience then, if Yeshua is the Lamb of God and our Passover Lamb, then the Passover had to be about a born again experience also. You understand what I'm saying? All right. It's not our fault that we were not taught these things because we were taught by people who didn't understand it themselves. We were taught by people that did not associate the Old Testament with the New Testament. They took the New Testament for itself, getting aside the Old Testament. But Paul gives us a hint in those scriptures we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 that Yeshua is our Passover lamb that was sacrificed for us. So what would that have meant if the Corinthians had not been through Passover Seder? 1 Corinthians chapter 11 talks about the Passover. When are we going to stop, okay, this with the, the church? disassociating itself from what the Bible says is true. You understand what I'm saying? If the first church did Passover and they were in the synagogue on the Sabbath day where Moses was read and they learned about Yeshua as the Passover, that, that's what the book of Hebrews is about. The book of Hebrews is about how to take that Old Testament and apply it in the New Testament. It doesn't teach you how to get rid of the Old Testament. It teaches you how to apply it to your New Testament faith. You understand what I'm saying? So when we do this Passover Seder, it's all about helping someone through a born again experience. It's all about teaching them you don't have to suffer through the repercussions and the trauma of the past. We're going to bring you to face to face with that trauma and drama in your life. And we're going to allow you to repair it and to make you whole and choose a new beginning. Because by the time you are finished with this Seder, we're going out and you have been born again. You get a whole new chance. You get a whole new opportunity. You become a new creation in Christ. God calls you his firstborn of God. And if they mess with you, God says he's going to get them. You are now free to worship God the way that you want to without other people's opinions about what you are doing because you are the firstborn of God and he is your father. So you go from being fatherless into being what? God, your father. What about those who were single parents who didn't know anything about a father? Why are we teaching them how God is your father? How you are his firstborn? And how, he'll, uh, how he will take care of you? How many men never had a relationship with their father? So when they look at God, God, they think of their father. God is not like your father. He's not like an earthly father. Okay, he was willing to destroy an entire nation to defend you, to bring you out. He saw us in our misery and brought us out. And we didn't come out empty handed. Let me tell you, God has a place for us. Okay, he has a place for us in. God is not like any earthly father that we could ever imagine. And if we would teach a father like God, how our families would be if we used him as the example. That's why God constantly says, teach your children. And I didn't realize how late it is. I'm, I'm, I'm finished, guys. To teach your children. And how we are to do what? 
be an example for them. As the firstborn of God, we are to be an example for all the other family members to follow, guys. Because don't you know your younger kids usually follow the example of that oldest one? Because they look up to the oldest one. You understand? We're the firstborn of God. It's time for us to assume our rightful position. Because God has empowered us with what? A double portion blessing. That's that Elijah blessing upon Elisha. A double portion. We're just like that young man. He said, you had a problem with your knee? Let me pray for you. Okay? And get you healed. Look at the boldness of that. Because when you, un he don't have to understand all the Torah. He, he just have to understand God is a healer. Okay? And what he did for me, he'll do it for you. If he redeemed me out of my mess, he'll redeem you out of yours. And that's what we need to tell people and why we need to invite them to our Passovers. All right, Ed, go ahead and pray us out. Father God, we thank you for this word today. Father, we thank you for the entire day. Lord, beginning this morning, the youth ministry to the word we just received. Thank you, Lord, that we're your ministers. We go forth shining light into a dark world. We thank you that you're, we are your children. We thank you that we're your firstborn. We thank you, Lord, for the double portion that you've given your children. Thank you, Lord, for this upcoming season. Lord, we with great expectation. Wait, Pesach, Father. Thank you to have us obedient. Thank you for having us in the right place at the right time, at the right moment. Thank you for having us to live according to your calendar, Father. Thank you, Lord God, for your blessing, for keeping us and protecting us. Thank you for blessing each household represented today. Father, as always, we pray peace once more in your holy city of Jerusalem and peace in this the diaspora, Father. We thank you, Father, for in the peace of the city that we've been carried away, we find peace. Now, Lord, we pray as always healing, Lord, for all those who heard this word today, healing, Father, Lord. And once again, we pray, Lord, for, for our sister Miriam and her time of grief, Father. Thank you, Lord, for the pastor. Thank you for the word. Thank you for the day. Thank you for the blessings that are coming from being obedient to your word. In Yeshua's name we pray, amen and amen. Thank you. Amen.